Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Curran, and I'm going to talk to you about reactive data visualization. So uh, first, I want to sort of put everything in context. <clears throat> data visualization as a field has a lot to offer in terms of suggesting how to visualize certain data based on the types of, field that, the, the types of fields that you have in the data and also how you perceive things visually. So there's this book, Semiology of Graphics, which is really amazing by this guy, Jacques Bertin, uh, in the 60s. Um, and there's this work by Jock McKinley, uh, a presentation tool. This is a paper that presents a sort of a taxonomy of visualization by types. Uh, and there's lots of other work. So Jacques Bertin has this theory, and he identifies these various uh, kinds of tasks in visualization. Uh, perceiving nominal data, meaning like different entities. Perceiving ordered data, which is different entities that have some ordering within them. And perceiving quantitative values. So I present this because I feel this is sort of how data visualization would ideally be approached. Because um, when you have a bunch of data, you have ultimately tables that you want to analyze. Um, and here's another theory from Jack McKinley. He says, you know, quantitative data, ordinal data, and nominal data each have these priorities of visual encodings. And position, like the xy coordinates, is the strongest that can represent any kind of data. And uh, so this is another theory. So w g given these theories, how can we implement the data visualizations? And this sort of con contextualizes D3 as well. Um, with web graphics, there are, there are these three main technologies. Uh, Canvas, which is immediate mode, so you issue a bunch of commands to draw the shapes on the screen. There's SVG, which is retained mode, so you add things to this collection of graphical objects. And then there's WebGL, which is you know, a binding for OpenGL for the web. And built on top of these, there's D3, which is becoming like the, you know, the, the most widely used visualization library. And there's also leaflet.js for geographic maps and 3.js for 3D graphics. So that's kind of the context of everything. So when people start using D3, um, what I've seen happen is people go to the D3 examples and try to find something that maps well onto what they're trying to do. And then you know, take, take one of the examples, like say the bar chart, for instance. Um, <clears throat> and then you can take this and customize it to work with your own data. But there are a couple problems with this because like, it's, it's hard-coded to a particular data set and it's hard-coded to be a particular size. Um, so this is kind of the reality. There are these visualization techniques that are kind of eternal, uh, like bar chart, scatter plot, parallel coordinates that can be applied to data in various situations. But what we have is the visualization techniques exist um, on top of fixed contexts, like the, the examples are hard-coded to certain data, for example. Uh, but ideally, you could take any data set and match it up with any visualization technique. And people have started trying to make this happen with all these various attempts to generalize the D3 examples. Uh, one of them is the towards reusable charts approach that uh, we discussed a little bit. And there are lots of libraries. So all of them are, they have their merits. Uh, and I'm sort of introducing a new idea uh, to the mix. So my experience, like how I got into making this thing that I'm about to describe is, I did an internship at a company called Rapid7. They do cybersecurity data analysis. And uh, I ended up developing this visualization dashboard with three linked views. This presents user logons to a corporate network. Um, and each logon event has a time, a place, a method that they used to log in, and whether the logon was uh, successful or a failure. So this is what I came up with to visualize that data. And uh, these, these three views are all linked together. So each view filters the data that's used as input to all the others. So when you zoom in on the map, 
that causes the data to be filtered that's being used as input to the other views and you can select a region of time and that filters the data used as input to the other views and same thing with the bar chart. And uh, in this work I used Backbone to represent the state of each visualization. And I found the same pattern recurring over and over and over again, uh, which is the following. So when you use Backbone and try to represent visualization state and certain parts within the visualization that should update in response to changes in properties, I found myself uh, doing this. Like, let's say you, you want to compute the visualization based on the width and the height. Let me make this bigger. So this is a backbone model here. So you can listen for changes in these properties. And what happens is, let's say only the width changes first, and then the height changes. The backbone callback will be invoked twice, once for the width, once for the height because the way that Backbone invokes the callbacks is synchronous in response to the changes in the properties. And that wasn't quite the behavior that I wanted. You know, I wanted the visualization to recompute only after all the properties had been set. So to get that behavior, um, you can debounce the function un using underscores debounce. What this does is uh, cues this function to be executed once on the next tick of the JavaScript event loop. So whatever properties get set um, in the current execution path, you know, they sort of collapse into one call to this callback, ultimately. Um, but then you'd have the case where, let's say, only the width got defined and not the height. Um, you know, you can't build the visualization, so you need to check, are all the dependent properties defined? You know, are they all not null? And only then can you build the visualization. So, you know, in all the various visualization components, I found myself having to write the same code over and over and over again. So I abstracted it away into a cleaner function that does the same thing. Um, and that's this model.win function. Um, the name win comes from the world of uh, functional programming, uh, functional reactive programming. It's an operator that takes as input several reactive functions and gives as output you know, another, you know, a property that changes in response to inputs. So the syntax here is inspired by um, like Angular's dependency injection and require.js. So the first argument here is an array of properties that this function is depending on. And then those values are injected into the callback when they're all defined. And um, multiple changes collapse to one execution of the callback. So this is part of the model.js library that I made. It's basically the same as Backbone, but only the model part. And with a cleaner API for getting and setting values. So instead of calling model.set and model.get, you can just access properties on the model object as though it were a plain old JSON object. Uh, but the library still listens for changes in properties by using um, defined properties on the object with setter and getter functions that get invoked. So this basic pattern can be used to create uh, data dependency graphs. And this is kind of from the world of functional reactive programming and uh, data flow programming. Uh, it's a way of abstracting flows of update propagation such that the code for each update is you know, sort of isolated from the code for each other update. So I'll, I'll, t I'll explain it more clearly in a second. So here's an example where you have a first name and a last name property and you want to compute a full name property, which is you know, the, last name plus, uh, the first name plus the last name. So this is how you would write the code. When the first name and the last name change, update the full name. And this is a visual representation of that, of that little flow. And 
this pattern can be used to create data flow graphs with multiple hops. So here's like x, y, z. When x changes, that updates y. And then when y changes, that updates z. So these are kind of toy examples just to demonstrate what this thing is. Um, but the, this primitive can be used to build uh, reactive visualizations. So here's the flow diagram for a reactive bar chart. So I'll run this example. There's the, the, a main program that's invoking this bar chart and just sort of setting random data on it. And it's reacting to changes in the size of the window as well. So if I resize, um, it'll react to those changes. And it's randomly setting the label on the, on the y-axis also. So this is what the data flow graph looks like for this bar chart. Um, whenever the page layout changes, that updates a model property called size. And then that sort of flows through. Um, this part here encapsulates D3's uh, conventional margins idea, where you have a margin object and also a width and height of the outer box to compute the width and height of the inner box. So you know, th those changes would propagate through, and the bars would be recomputed. So this is, in a way, superior to the other way of doing it, which is the uh, towards reusable charts API idea, because the update paths are sort of isolated. So let's say you had a visualization where the color, the color map would change. Uh, with this setup, it wouldn't have to recompute the whole visualization. It would only recompute what's necessary to be recomputed. So that's the gist of model.js. And now I'm going to go through some example code where we start with the original D3 bar chart example. And we go through a process of you know, integrating model.js with this example to make it reusable and reactive and able to be composed with other visualizations. So here we go with the example code. Um, this is the original D3 bar chart. This is a little example viewer for the code. So here's the bar chart in here. So this is just you know, copy and pasted from part three of Mike Bostock's tutorial, Let's Make a Map. So he's really explained well all the stuff that's gone into this in this tutorial series. So I'm going to take it from there. So there's some CSS to define the color of the bars, and things like that. I've made a little modification to use uh, require.js, which is a JavaScript module loader, um, because that's what model.js uses. So it's requiring D3. And then this code is directly from Mike Bostock. And I've added some comments to highlight the issues that I see with this example. And I see these issues pop up in, all, in many, many D3 examples as I'm trying to adapt them to whatever it is that I'm doing. So the first issue is it's hard coded to be one specific size. You know, there's 950, you know, 960 and 500 right in there. Um, and, and the width and the height of the inner box is computed you know, just once. So that kind of precludes having a dynamic size. Another issue is um, this SVG size is assigned just once. So that's something that will need to be moved around for dynamic size. Another issue is <coughs> defining the domains. You know, in this code that defines the domain for the x and y scales, it references directly the field in the data. So like in my, in my mind, the, the visualization code shouldn't need to know about the specific field that's being accessed. Like that should be generalized. And here's another issue uh, with the example. These, these DOM trees for the axes are added to the DOM in response to the data being loaded. So if you wanted to load another you know, slice of the data or another data set, you know, this shouldn't be here. This should be somewhere else. So in, in the next couple examples, the theme is separating things that happen once from things that can happen multiple times as like a first step. Um, and here again, 
the code that defines the height of each bar is hard coded to be a particular field in the data. So in this next example, the only change is it's separated now into different files. So there's a main HTML page and a JavaScript file and a CSS file. It's just separated into different files. Um, so here, I'm introducing uh, model.js. So the only thing that changes is require.js is being configured to have model as an available module. And you can install it with Bower, uh, which is a great client-side JavaScript um, package manager. So in the main file, now we're requiring D3 and model. And we're just creating a new model. This is the API to create a new model instance. So it's, it's kind of like a backbone model. So those are the only changes so far. It's not using the model yet. So in this, in this step, uh, this variable g is being introduced. And I found this is useful for a number of reasons, because things can be appended to this element um, dynamically. Um, in the original example, this, it, w it was all kind of clumped together. So G will contain the inner part of the visualization and will be transformed based on the margin. Um, here, two more variables are introduced, the uh, groups for the axes. You know, before, in the, in the original example, these were just appended to the DOM once, and then you have no reference to them, so you can't update them later. So. So yeah, it makes sense to uh, extract them as variables so you can update the axes later. So in this next example, the bars, the code that makes the bars is changed to, be, to handle dynamic data. So this is the original example, and this is sort of the core visualization code that makes the bars. Uh, select all bar, you know, bind it to the data, and then in the enter virtual selection, it's appending the rectangle, but it's also computing the size and the xy of each bar in the enter virtual selection. But for a dynamic chart, you know, this part should be separated out. It shouldn't happen in the enter part. It should happen in a part that could uh, be executed again and again. So the next change deals with that. So now we're making the selection. And then on the enter virtual selection, it's only appending the rect uh, SVG nodes, and then it is uh, computing the size of each bar in the uh, update part of the flow. So this will deal with dynamic data. And then this part will remove the, the DOM elements as the data elements uh, get removed. So now we're in a position to really start using model.js after we've done all this kind of initial work to separate what happens once from what happens many times. So now instead of rendering the visualization in response to the data, in, in, res, in response to the file with the data being loaded, so now the code is loading the data file and then setting model.data equals data. And then every second, it's setting model.data to be a random uh, sample of that data. And then here it's using the model.when operator to respond to changes in that data field. So that data field is just the array of objects. And all the, all the code from here on out is the same. But because of the changes we made, this code can execute many times with different arrays, and everything would work out fine. So what happens now is uh, the bars are being updated with this random data that's being set every second. Uh, but it's still, you know, it, it's not fitting inside the box. So there are still a lot of issues. But now we've made dynamic data work. So in this next change, the bar chart code is separated out from the main program. So in my mind, you know, each visualization type should be encapsulated into something that has no connection with the original data set. 
so here's barchart.js, which is most of the code from before. And here's the main.js program that instantiates a bar chart and loads the data and then sets the data field on the bar chart, which causes it to update and re-render. Um, so notice how this is constructed. It's a module that returns a constructor function for a bar chart. And the thing that gets returned from the constructor function is the model. So the idea with this model.js thing is that the model itself can become the API to access the visualization. So in this next example, the X and Y attributes, rather than being hard-coded, are now generalized. So let's see what's changed. In the main program, um, we're using this other way of setting attributes called uh, set, you know, model.set. This is part of the library. So you can give it a, an object, you know, key value pairs, and it will assign uh, those as properties on the model and propagate the changes through. So <clears throat> now there are these new fields, x attribute and y attribute. And in the main program, they're being tailored to the data set. Uh, and in the bar chart code, um, here's the model.win function. And it's now depending on data, x attribute, and y attribute. So whenever any of these things change, changes, that triggers a redraw of the visualization. So instead of accessing that particular field, it's now using x attribute and y attribute to extract the values from each data element. So in the next step, we're generalizing the y-axis label. So in the, <coughs> in the original code, the, uh, the y-axis label is hard-coded to be a particular thing. Here it is. Y-axis dot, you know, y-axis text dot text is being set to frequency. And this is something that can be generalized. So in this, this next example, there's another call to model dot win that just updates the y-axis text. So this is sort of showing how multiple calls to this model.win can be introduced that deal with different parts of the visualization independently. <coughs> so in the main program now, um, we're setting this property y-axis label to be frequency. And then we're responding to it here. So when the y-axis label string changes, um, that that gets pushed through to the y-axis DOM. So at this point, there's no code at all in the bar chart that's specific to the data set. Um, so next, we need to deal with uh, resizing. Oh, there's one other thing. So check out this code. model.win, y-axis label, and then a function that gets invoked. Uh, and there's another way to use this API by passing in a third argument. So now it's been changed to, to pass in a third argument. That's the argument that will, bound, will be bound to this in the callback, you know, the keyword this. So that means you can pass in these D3 functions that will be invoked with uh, this thing bound to this. So now, now it's one line of code instead of three. And this, this pops up a lot with D3 code. Um, so it the code just becomes more succinct. So this next example uh, just renames x to x scale and y to y scale. Uh, it's just a rename in preparation for adding them as uh, properties on the model. So in this example, the scales are made into model properties. So this is kind of key because the scales can, can change depending on uh, several inputs, the size of the visualization and also the data. So here's some code that uh, defines the x and y scales. So it's saying the x scale is dependent on the data and the x attribute. So every time the data changes or the x attribute changes, it creates a new scale. And um, 
it sets the range based on the width. So this is something we should really change. You know? So the width itself should also become a model property that's depended upon. So that's sort of the next step. Uh, but right now, it's setting x and y scale based on data and x attribute, or, and data and y attribute for the y scale. And then the visualization code is depending on data, x attribute, y attribute, and the scales. And so you can see that introducing these when callbacks uh, is starting to kind of make the code cleaner in a way. So these callbacks deal with individual parts of the update flow through the visualization. So in this next step, we can use model.js to encapsulate these uh, conventional margins that you see in a lot of D3 examples. So here we're setting margin as a model property rather than having it as a variable in the closure. You know, top right, bottom left, according to the conventional margins from D3. Um, and I've introduced another property called box, which is an object that has width and height of the outer container for the visualization. And so this little piece of code right here encapsulates the idea of conventional margins. So whenever the size of the div changes or the margin changes, model.width and model.height are set. Uh, so width and height being the width and height of the inner box of the visualization, you know, inside the margins. So here, we can see how, you know, setting the width and the height of the SVG attribute, before that was kind of done once up front, but now it can be done in response to any time the, you know, the size of the container changes. And here, the transform on the G attribute, which contains the visualization, the inner box, uh, happens in response to changes in the margin property on the model. So you see everything is slowly becoming more uh, responsive and like dynamic. So now, um, yeah, I think we covered that step. So the next step is to use a container div that contains the bar chart. So in the original example, I'm looking for where it creates the SVG element. Here, in the original example, it just appends an SVG element to the body of the page. So that'll just put it in some random place on the page, right? But when you're really using a chart, it should be in one particular place. So this next step introduces a div on the page that is going to be the container for the chart. And uh, some CSS has been added to uh, size that particular uh, container. And it's gray, so we can see where it is. So this is now where the bar chart should go. Um, and this, this is dynamic. Like when you resize the page, the size of that div will also update because of how CSS works. Um, so now that we have that div, uh, we can pass in that div to the constructor of the bar chart. And um, instead of appending an SVG to the body, now the code appends an SVG to that div. And it has access to that div, so we can see what the size is. So that's the next step. So the, the, the size is still hard-coded. Um, in this example, we implement dynamic resize. So in the main function, um, it's now listening to resize events on the page. And then when a resize event occurs, it's setting the box property on the model, which is the bar chart API, based on the width and height of the div. So the way that the bar chart is coded, uh, those that change will just propagate through the, de the dependency graph. So if we run this full screen, we can see that when we resize, the, resizes, uh, the resize events propagate through in the correct way. So 
The next example just cleans up the code um, implementing the single var pattern, putting all the variables on the top. And now you see what we have for this reusable bar chart is now a bunch of these callbacks uh, passed into model.win. So, and each one deals with one particular piece of the visualization logic. Um, so this is sort of the final result. A bunch of these win callbacks that deal with specific things. Um, and this here is the whole logic uh, for rendering the bars. And everything else is kind of generic and reusable, like Y scale, Y axis, things like that. So, so I thought to myself, you know, what if these uh, reactive little subcomponents of visualizations could be extracted into a set of reusable components that you can use to construct reusable visualizations? Um, so that's the end of the example code. Um, well, let me go in the order that I was that I have the slides. So that's how you can construct a reusable component, and then they can be composed together by linking interactions with model properties. So here's an example of linked views with this approach. So here's a scatter plot where you can brush, and that brush. Um, when, so this is D3's brushing behavior, and you can, this code hooks into that and then sets a model property to be the selected records, and then there's a reactive function that listens for changes in that and then updates the bar chart based on that. Um, so this demonstrates how you can create linked views with this approach. And here's another example of a, a choropleth map and a timeline that are linked together. So this shows population of all the world countries. And as you hover over a year in this timeline view, and each line down here is a country, um, as you hover over each year, the data used as input to the visualization on the top is sliced by that year. So you can have interactions like this, where you can really smoothly see you know, how the, how the data changes over time. And if you click here, it pins to that particular year. And then if you zoom in on the map, that defines the subset of data that's used as input to the chart on the bottom. And one last example. Um, this can be also linked in with UI components like bootstrap list groups. So here's an example where uh, you can select the fields of a scatter plot. So the sort of future work with this is generalizing the visualization, like the subcomponents of the visualizations. And uh, I've sort of done that a little bit already. So here's the diagram that shows the flow for that bar chart example code that we just went through. Uh, but a lot of these subgraphs could be reused across many different visualizations. Like here's, here's a listing of a few of them. Uh, like the margin component, this encapsulates the idea of a conventional margin in D3. Uh, the scales, uh, the labels for the axes. So I've started uh, working on this in this library called Reactiviz. Uh, so here, here's like a first pass. It's just, I just started it, you know, it hasn't gone very far. Um, but this encapsulates these reusable subgraphs. And so now the code for the bar chart looks like this. You know, use all these reusable components, and then this is the code that really focuses on mapping the data to the visual marks. And so this is a bar chart, and this is a scatter plot, where it's using all the same generalized things, like the margin, and the axes, and the only thing that you really need to focus on now is how do you encode the data as visual marks. So I think this is kind of a, a good direction because 
the developer can now just focus on applying those visualization theories to the task at hand rather than dealing with like all these little details. Um, so, and another direction I would like to go with this is to have um, configurable visualization dashboards where there's some JSON configuration like this that will map to uh, a layout of visualization components. And then each co the configuration for each visualization, like here you can change the color, um, is encapsulated as you know, key value pairs that corresponds to the, m the model, uh, you know, model JS model. Um, so this has a lot of potential, I think. Um, you could, based on this, you could introduce an undo-redo framework where the state is encapsulated in this JSON, and you could look at the diffs, and also implement um, real-time synchronization between many clients looking at the same visualization environment. So that's kind of, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's it. That's my work, so I, any questions are welcome. Yeah? Uh, do you have any examples of persisting these models? Examples of persisting the models? Uh, no, not yet. But it should be possible. Um, and with the model.js framework, you can uh, use json.stringify to serialize the model and, call, and just call model.set on the, the thing that you uh, use json.parse to deserialize. So I mean, it should be theoretically possible, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, yeah? So, so you, you build a kind of your own functional little language here with your own evaluation functions and plugging the high order functions and all of that, right? I think that's pretty cool. But um, the problem with this kind of things is uh, as you scale it, it becomes kind of difficult to scale because you have all the dependency graphs and how you evaluate the order of dependencies and the graph equivalents and stuff like that. So how, how does this scale for, have you tried it for a large number of functions like that? Yeah, so the question is, how does the performance scale with large data dependency graphs? Yeah, so that could become an issue because the way I'm implementing it is uh, by debouncing the function. So that's deferring until the next tick of the JavaScript event loop in order to execute the function. So that means that each, each uh, step through the data dependency graph you know, has to wait until the next tick of the JavaScript event loop. And I think I think uh, that's like, I don't know, four milliseconds or something. So yeah, conceivably, if you had really long graphs of dependencies, then it would slow down a lot. But what I've seen in practice is like the visualization dependency graphs are really not that wide. Like there's not that many hops. So I haven't seen it become an issue, but it, yeah, potentially it could. Yeah? So I'm curious why you are debouncing updates through the model rather than just hooking the render to request animation frame, since generally altering the variables on the model is very cheap and it's actually modifying the DOM that's expensive. So you could probably get the same performance characteristics without uh, slow propagation through the graph. Yeah, so the comment was you could leverage um, request animation frame to manage the rendering, right? Yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. I've actually thought about it. I haven't done it yet, but yeah, that's. Definitely, there's room for improvement based on request animation frame. Uh, yeah? So it might be tangential to that com comment. Um, how, are, how do you handle like transitions and doing transition chaining and things like that for uh, using this approach? Yeah, the question was, how do you handle transitions with this approach? Um, I haven't actually done that yet. But I have the feeling that it would just work properly because of the way D3 handles transitions. So if you call the uh, the update code, I think it would work, but I don't I don't know. I haven't tried it. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have I tried using cross f using this approach to like mimic what cross filter does? Well, no. Just like for example, here if you're finding JSON data, but I don't know, I'm studying cross filter JS right now. And yeah, so the question is like, how does this relate to what CrossFilter does, basically? Or how, how could you reproduce 
what CrossFilter does using this approach? Is there a way to combine them? Oh, a way to combine them? Yeah. Huh. Um, I haven't thought about it. I mean, maybe there is. Maybe there is. So you just need to connect like, something to the data itself, and then when the data changes, then your application reacts to that problem. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it should be, it should be possible to use CrossFilter as like, part, of the, part of the reactive model. Um, but I, ha I haven't tried it again. Um, yeah? Basically, what you're doing is you're kind of almost putting for the final step, which you're, you're basically extracting the dependency language out of all of this stuff. And there are lots of dependency languages that have been around for 50 years, like May. And one thing that's interesting about it is if you simply pulled that out, put it in a declarative structure, you could go on and do analysis on it, figure out exactly all the stuff on it, figure out what the maximum delay would be, figure out what you know would throw anything. So instead of having the blank clauses, drop the wins, just go on and put in the stuff on the left-hand side, colon, and stuff on the right-hand side, so the pink file is good. Then you've got basically your own dependency language coupled in with this other stuff. That's sort of, I think, the final step. Then you, you see get really excited about these pictures, right? Well, hell, I'll represent the pictures directly as opposed to uh, rapid runs and all this other things. Right, so you're suggesting making a language based on this rather than... Look up make. Make. make was used to go yeah. Right. Yeah, it is. And another related thing I want to kind of point out is uh, the library has baked into it a way of detecting this graph. Um, so it outputs this data. So this is actually a, you know, a layout thing here that but actually... Just represent it directly. That seems to be the input. That's why you drew the pictures. You felt the direct representation was the key contribution. So right. the language huh. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think, in fact, to, to the main point, I think, in fact, portability is a lot more powerful than make because you are pretty much building a, a combinatorial language, right? Or like uh, your own, uh, your own uh, functional type of language. So make is just a subset of that, right? So the point, I think, to, uh, to, to kind of generalize this a bit, so you can allow to build meta functions like uh, your own DSL, like, and you can able to think you are able to extend that as much as you want. Because what, that's what you're doing right now. You're doing the DSL, right? When you, when you build the generalization, you just build the DSL, but you just build it one level up. You shouldn't stop to one level. It should be a little bit arbitrary, bit, a combinatorial type of thing, right? Huh. I'm not sure I completely follow you. You're, well, you're saying? If you look, for example, like uh, you're building a, fun uh, a functional evaluation, uh, sorry, uh, um, a function evaluation here, right? So you have the top level, right? And you just plug in different uh, low level functions, right? Right, yeah. So I've got this framework where that will manage the update flows. Right. Well, that's a hard coded type of uh, uh, high order functional, functional program, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what he's suggesting is to use the make approach, right? So what I'm saying is you can do a lot better than that. By building this carefully, uh, careful low level abstractions, you can you can combine them easily, and you can do all sorts of really interesting combinations, including make or other type of uh, more abstract things. Look, look up combinatorial functions. Okay, yeah, I will. L I'll look up combinatorial functions. Yeah, it sounds like an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about uh, uh, have you heard about flapjacks? Flapjacks? No. What is it? Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are. What's really nice about your approach, though, especially the separate as a package, you integrate all this stuff together. So if you have a mechanism, in fact, where it's simply an add on package that, for example, adds into dependency language, whether it winds up being combinatorial or, or whether it winds up being simply static. The advantage of static, in fact, is you can do static analysis. It winds up having it's generally programmable, it's truly totally complete, which means you aren't going to know, you can't do a lot of analysis. Right. So it's a, uh, but the nice thing about this, your idea about combining it with the existing examples, dropping it into D3, it allows you to go on to reuse the components, and people are able to go on and basically do the D3 stuff separately from the dependency stuff, the picture, maybe, maybe doesn't pick that up. Right. 
And uh, one thing that comes to mind is like you suggested making a language where you encapsulate the dependencies. But um, one advantage of IC doing it this way is you can, you can have arbitrary JavaScript in those functions that, oh, OK. Say one more. I mean, if it's, if it's your language, you can make it do whatever you want. Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah? I was curious. Um, you're, in all the examples that I saw, the function arguments were exactly the same list as the things that they depended on. Right. Is that always going to be the case, or is, are there going to be cases where you depend on things that aren't arguments or vice versa? So you're talking about this replication here? Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of tricky. Uh, the idea is here it's, it's specifying the, the names of the properties, and here it's getting the values of the properties in this function closure. So I think these, these would always be the same names. I mean, but there's nothing stopping you from naming them differently. Is that, kind of, is that what you were getting at? Actually, what I was saying is, you know, what if it turned out that first, for instance, uh, there's something you want, you, you care about whether something changes, but it's not actually an argument to the function. Oh yeah, if you care about whether something changes but it's, you don't actually need to use the value. Right. Yeah, I've actually run into that and you can add another argument, you know, another element to this array but just ignore it in the callback function. That's possible. Yep. So I, I think we'll have to leave it at that. Yeah. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs>